Hi, welcome back to our lecture uh, about the practical guide to quantitative finance interviews. So we have just finished the whole chapter about green tea serve. So today we are gonna to move on to calculators. So first let's have an overview about this chapter. For this chapter, we are going to talk about calculus, derivatives, limitation, integration, all these things. And another main part is about linear algebra. Uh, we are also going to solve some ordinary differential equation, which covers different kinds of them. Uh, we are also going to tap a little bit on some frequently used techniques. Uh, for example, like Taylor series, Newton's method, or like range multipliers. So first, uh, let's first talk about the limits and derivatives. Before we start, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of this chapter. We know calculus and linear algebra actually lay the foundation for many advanced math topics, especially used in quantitative finance. Well, so basically during interview, you should be prepared to answer some calculus or linear algebra problems. And they are not going to be asked independently, I would say, they are often frequently incorporated into more complex problems. For example, some probability theory problem or some super complex application questions. Uh, so needless to say, uh, it's extremely difficult, but you need to work hard on that. And basically I'm trying to help you to work through all of that. I remember most of knowledge you have learned about that in your high school and in your undergraduate learning. Uh, so we are going to first uh, give us all ourselves a warm up about some basics. So first, how can we get derivatives? For example, let's have y equals to fx. Then we are going to define derivative, the first order derivative as equal to dy dx, right? Which can be get from the concept of limitation, where the delta x up to zero, delta x, delta y, which it's originally is this y. So I always like to uh, explain derivatives in a more geometric way. So for example, if we have this kind of graph and we have an x point and this is x1 we define the data x equals to x1 minus x so it's, it's going to be the landscape so basically we are actually trying to calculate this uh calculate th this transport okay. um, and it's basically the ratio between y and x and uh, when this comes closer and closer x1 Ash. Yeah, so we are going to have a few rules here. First, we are going to have the product rule, like the uv dx is gonna to be u dv dx plus what? v du dx. So how about the cotent? So the cotent rule, is going to be similar, like if we have a fraction, u over v, then it is going to be what? v square, and it's going to be v du minus u dv uh, on the numerator. And we also have the chain rule where actually like dy ds equals to dy du some kind of a third party uh, and du dx right and this is like the basic and we can also have some useful equations here so for example we have ax equals to what ex ln a and we are gonna to this is easy to be proved because we can just change it into e Law in a to the power of x, where a equals to a x. And we know that law in a b equals to law in a plus law in b. And one of the things that is frequently used is this one. 
ex is actually the limitation when n comes to the positive infinity x over n to the power of n. So it actually has a quite interesting story here. Uh, so this question is one of the mathematic mathematicians uh, sent to Euler, you know, the famous uh, mathematician. So he is asking this kind of question is like, uh, hey, I got like one dollar. So I know I can get some interest if I put it into the bank as a deposit and take it out sometime later, right? But I mean, if I put this $1 into my bank account at this minute, I'm going to pick it out on next minute and I do this again and again. So I can definitely get some interest, right? Although it's a quite a small portion. But I mean, but what he, is, he was thinking about is that uh, as long as we got this interest, and its limitation uh, is infinity. Then I, then I don't need to work. I just need to stand in front of an ATM and I keep deposit this $1 into that. Right? But actually EULA helps me to prove that there is actually a limitation and this limitation is just e to the power of x. Yeah, so which means we still need to hard work to earn some money. Yeah, but bad ending, huh? So, and these two are also important, let me think. So uh, these two are about the situation where X comes to infinity. X to the power of R, law in X is gonna to be zero for any R plus zero, larger than zero. And limitation X to the power to infinity, X to the power of R multiplied by E to the power of negative X is gonna to be zero for any R. And we also need to remember the three sign for sign thing. So uh, I'm going to uh, neglect the dx part. So, sorry. So d sine x is gonna to be cosine. d cosine x is gonna to be negative sine x. And d tangent is gonna to be sec x square, which if you are from mainland, it's basically is y over cosine x and to the power of two. So I think it's, these are quite useful equations. Uh, you may come to it when we solve some questions below. Uh, I'm going to talk about that. So let's come to our first question. The first one is, what's the derivative of y equals to log x to the power of log x? Uh, I know it's a little bit confusing here, but actually what does this question mean is that uh, this log in x uh, and to the power of log in x instead of log in x to the power of log in x. So this is wrong, okay? This is wrong. This is what, what this question means. So it's actually a good problem, I think, to test your knowledge of basic derivative formulas. Uh, my advice, my general advice on this kind of question is that as long as we see something to the power of something, like a to the power of b, uh, the first step is almost always to take a natural log of that. So we have log in y, right, equals to what? Equals to log in, log in x, log in x, which equals to log in x multiplied by log in log in x, right? And then applying the chain rule, what are we going to have five? If we take the derivative of this log in y, then it is gonna to be y over y, right? If you know that. And dy dx, equals to, and this part, it is gonna to be equals to x, because log in x, when it takes derivative, it's gonna to be one over x. So it, the numerator is going to be log in, log in x, and the denominator is x, plus what? Plus x, log in x, and this one is also log in x. So these two are canceled out. So basically what we have
is that we are this y. dy dx is gonna be equal to uh, y of x multiplied by log in, log in x plus y, right? So for this part, we are actually applying the product rule here, right? To solve this question. And this is gonna to be the final answer. Uh, to remind you, I think it's always a good habit to keep this part, no matter if it's useful or not. During your, during your solving process, uh, but you keep these derivatives. Uh, I kind of would like to neglect it or just leave it there, but I know it's bad, okay? So now let's come to the second question. Without calculating the numerical results, can you tell me which number is larger, uh, e to the power of pi or pi to the power of e? Well, I actually first met this question during my high school. You know, I'm from a school program. So basically like the last question of the mass Gao Kao. So it's gonna to be like this level and it's about derivatives. Uh, nowadays I see it quite simple. It's related with maximum or minimum. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, uh, remind you of what it's like for using derivatives to define the to determine the maximum and minimum. So for local maximum or minimum, if FC, the first derivative at C is gonna be zero, and the second derivative is greater than zero, then it is gonna to be a local minimum. If the second derivative is smaller than zero, then it is going to be a local maximum. Uh, this is the same, right? The first order is still need to be zero, okay? So how can we solve this question? Again, so we have something to the power of something, right? So the first step is to what? Is to take the log. So by taking the log, we basically have pi log in E equals to pi, right? And this part is what? E log in pi. So we can have something like log in E divided by E. We are going to compare this versus what? Pi over log in pi. So now we can define a GX, which equals to X log in X, right? And now if we take this derivative, the first order derivative is gonna to be y minus log in x, and the denominator is x squared. And we can see that uh, as long as y x is smaller than e, then g x is going to be larger than zero, so it is increasing. And when it is larger than e, it is going to be decreasing. So the local maximum is at x equal to e, right? So log in e, e is gonna to be the largest, which means that we have this one. And if we put all the way back, it means that this is the larger sign and this is the larger sign. So we get our final result that e pi is larger than pi e. Okay, because this y is actually local, local maximum. Okay, now we come to the famous Mimi. So it's already become international Mimi, Lobida's room. It seems like for all the undergraduate students in mainland, as long as they come to some high school problem, uh, high, higher math problem, uh, they kind of want to use Lobita. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the English, it's actually the same with hospital. Yeah, it's actually the meaning. The meaning is indeed the hospital. But I mean, we need to speak it in French. So it is going to be Lobita. H, does, H is silent, okay? H is silent. So still, uh, we for Lobita's room, we know that uh, 
the limitation x to a f x g x this is Lobita's room, right? It's gonna be the same with limitation x to a and the first order of fx uh, and the first order derivative of gx on the denominator. So the main usage of this one, Lobita's rule, is to convert the limit from an indeterminate form to a determinate form. Uh, but still, there are some limitations. Right. Please remember all these limitations. First, fx, gx are differentiable. Okay. This is d. And second, limit x to a. G A is not gonna to be zero. Otherwise it's undefined because it's a fraction format. And now we come to the question, what's the limit of E X uh, divided by X square as X to infinity? So this is the first question. Uh, let's call it A then. And this is B. So let's solve A first. First, we can see that both E to the power of X and X square are differentiable. And uh, when it comes to infinity, x squared is not gonna to be zero. It is gonna to be infinity as well, right? So we can apply the Lobita's room. So it is gonna to be equal to e x two x, right? And then we can further reduce it again. We can apply the Lobita's room twice to reduce it again to e x two. And we can see that it goes to infinity, right? And for the B, we can define it as ln x and also uh, y over x squared, right? So again, all these two uh, are not going to be zero. Uh, this gx is not going to be zero while x goes to zero. Uh, from the right hand side, and also both of them are differentiable, so we can apply the Lobita theorem. And by taking derivatives for both parts, it is going to be one over x, and for this, it is going to be negative two uh, x to the power of three, and then it is going to be negative two x squared, uh, which is going to be zero as well. So we proved that, and basically these are two classic examples uh, about derivatives and limitation. Now let's go to the integration part. I usually think it as the inverse of uh, differentiation. So it's like the antiderivative, right? So if fx, let's define it as f, the larger fx, the first order, then this integration, is gonna to be the same with this one, dx. Always remember the dx, okay? So which is gonna to be fx from a to b equals to fb minus fa. So please remember it's actually fb plus c minus fa plus c. That is a constant item here. So sometimes you cannot support that, especially for interview question. It shows that you are a detailed oriented people. And basically the general, there is also some rules about the integration. For example, the first one is integration by substitutions. So integration of f g x and g slash x, it is going to be the same with f u, du, where u equals to gx, and du is gonna to be g slash x dx. So remember this dx here, right? It's quite important. And also they are integration by parts. So like if we take the integration of u dv, it's gonna to be the same with uv minus 
taking the version of v d u. Okay. So let's first do a warm up question. What is the integral of ln x? Uh, it's actually quite simple. We just and it's actually a classic example of doing integration by parts. So we first write it down. So we need to take the integration of ln x dx. So we can define what? So we can define like u is equals to ln x and dv is gonna to be dx, which means that v equals to x. So it is gonna to be the same with x multiplied by ln x. So it's uv, right? And minus what? x to x and we take the derivative of du is gonna to be one over x dx. So remember the, remember this dx part here, okay? So these two are canceled out as one. So if we take that, it is gonna to be x log in x minus one, uh, anti-derivative of dx is going to be x and plus this constant c. So that's why, I, that's what I mean. Like we always need to remember that is uh, any constant c, right? okay. So next question, uh, it's about the, all the triangle functions, okay. So let's first go back and let you remember all these things we have these three things here, right? Please take a look. So for all the triangle or metric functions, I think the largest obstacle for you to solve that is to know all the things about that. So for this question, that is actually a very classic example here. We want to take integral of zero to pi over six of sec x. I'm going to write it as one over cosine x dx. So we want to find a solution for this one, right? And we can first take the derivative of all a few other things. So we know, we already know that d tangent x equals to sec square x, right? And if we take the derivative of sec x, it is basically the same as take the derivative of y over cosine x. So this is going to be cosine uh, square x with what? Uh, with sine x here, right? Which this is actually the same as sine x or sine x multiplied by one over cosine x equals to what? Tangent x multiplied by sec x. So have we found something interesting here? The derivative of a sec x plus tangent x dx is gonna to be sec x tangent x plus sec x. And we have both sec x plus tangent x uh, before the derivative and after the derivative. And here is what we want to do here. If we take the line, you know that you know that is a trick. If we found this kind of pattern here, one of the things you can do, just to remember it, is to take the law. So if we take the law of, uh, because within the log function, so it has to be have the absolute value sign. So absolute value of sec x plus tangent x divided by dx is gonna to be sec x, and this is going to be sec plus tangent 
and this the denominator is also going to be sec plus tangent rather canceled out, which keeps that as sec x. So we have that zero pi over six sec x is gonna to be what? It's gonna to be loy sec x plus tangent x pi over six zero, and the result is gonna to be log uh, square root three. If we just calculate, put first put like pi over six into these two, and then put zero into these two and take the difference. Uh, I mean, some of you may still have question about why we need to take the law in here. So let's see this function. So law in u, dx, d law in u, u is some function of x, okay? It's gonna to be one. It's gonna to be u, one over u multiplied by du dx. So you can see that it is gonna to be like du u, right? So it's like take the derivative of this part and dx. So, which means if we have something here, like the derivative, uh, the, the value before the derivative and after the derivative is the same, then we can use this structure by taking the log to cancel them out because they are same to get the other part, which cannot be canceled out. And it's like a technique that is frequently used in uh, taking calculus. I think like calculating calculus uh, or integration is much harder than taking derivatives uh, because it, it requires you have a lot of, to remember a lot of this kind of small uh, skill sets and small uh, formulas or lemma that can be applied. And now let's see two uh, classic application problem. So the first one, suppose there are two cylinders which with radius one intersect at right angles and their centers also intersect. What's the volume of the intersection? So it's something like this one, right? We have a cylinder here. Sorry, my drawing is not that good looking. And we have another one here. So we we'll modify this cross section of it. To solve this question, I also get a screenshot from the Wikipedia. It actually goes in name, like this intersection part is called by cylinder. That's why this question is super classic because you know, this part even have its own name, okay? So you can see the Wikipedia actually gives us some hints. So if we look from like, if we're looking for these two sides, it's gonna to be a circle and with radius one. And, but if we are looking like from upside down, it's gonna to be a square here. And this square is actually, it's, length is going to be smaller and smaller. And what's the range of that? So this volume, so for any volume, the function is the general integration function is that volume equals to z1, z2, the starting point and the ending point of the area function of dz, right? And you can see the part here. So if we define this as Z, then this square is going to be what? It's, this is gonna to be two because there are two of them multiplied by, by zero to radius is R here, is R. And the length is gonna to be two R square minus two Z square and D Z, right? We just need to solve this one. So why it is the case? Because we first look it upside down and the total square of this kind of, the, the total area of this square 
is gonna to be two z and to the power of two, right? So this one is the area that it wants to go. And then we also want the highest part. So we need to look at this one. So this is basically the z we are getting here. And we want this r square minus this z square to get this, to get this length, to get this length. And basically it's the same as the length of this one. And we take the, so this length is gonna be what? It's gonna be r square minus two r square minus two z square. Yeah. And I hope you can get that. So by taking this, it is gonna to be 16 over three. And now let's come to our last question. It's about the snow began to fall sometime before noon. And at a constant rate, the city of Cambridge, you know, where Harvard and MIT was, uh, it's the Cambridge in US, not in UK, okay? So send out the snow power at noon to clean, basically to clean the avenue. And uh, the power removed snow also at a constant rate a minute. And at 1 p.m. it had moved two miles and at 2 p.m. three miles. And when did the snow begin to fall? So first, again, we need to find like two functions that could be the same to make us to uh, get an equation, okay? And maybe you can find some time to think about that. So we need to find the intersection part. Okay, so now let's tell you something. Let's say it's like 12 p.m. This is the T0 where snow begins. And this is like 1 p.m. let's say. And this is 2 p.m. So when it comes to p.m., 1 p.m., it has moved two miles. And all these two miles is not is gonna to have none of snow there, right? By the end of 1 p.m., which means the area cleaned is gonna to be the same with every snow, right? So a function is being found. So now we start to define something. So let's first define noon, this part. Okay, let's use the red pen here as t equals to zero, okay? And uh, this y is going to be, this total length is gonna to be t. And the snow, uh, let's define the V as the uh, volaticity. of the power flow. And C1 is volume of snow. That can be moved. Oh, that can be removed. And C2 is the increased snow area. Then we can find the volatility is actually going to be one. The total volume cleaned divided by the total, total concessional area of the snow. Right. 
And again, this AP could also be one. Like because snow is snowing at the speed of C2, multiplied by the total time it has snowed, which is T plus T. This T, small t, is going to be calculated from 12 PM. Then V is going to be equal to C1 over C2, T plus T, where we could define C equals to C1 over C2, just to make it just one variable to simplify the question, to be C over T plus T. And now we're going to have two equations here. We know that from zero to one, C T plus T dt is going to be equals to two. So the total miles has been claimed. And from zero to two, C over T plus T dt is going to be three. <clears throat> and by solving these two questions, we are going to have T equals to square root minus one over two. Okay, just by combining these two equations together. So again, let's go through this question. So AT is the total snow area, right? So it's gonna to be the speed of the snow and, and the T plus T is the total time since snowing. But Meanwhile, so the volatility of the power provides a way to combine it with the snowing area. So the C1 is a volume of snow that can be removed if we divide it uh, <coughs> per hour. If we divided it by the total area uh, snowing, then we can know that <laughs> the volatility because volatility is actually what is the distance divided by time, right? Distance divided by time. So basically, it's going to be the all questions for today. Thank you for watching. And the next lecture, we are going to talk more about Taylor expansion and also the other useful equations or techniques in solving calculus questions. See you then. Bye-bye.